if you want to look at an extreme example of, of physics, you'll probably have to look long, long ago to the Big Bang or far, far away to a supermassive black hole at the center of a distant galaxy. But if you want to look at the most extreme bio, extreme chemistry in the universe, all you have to do is look under your nose because that's what living systems do. They do extreme chemistry. Um, the talks today, an extremely exciting lineup, um, really will showcase how chemistry provides not just tools, but also a point of view uh, to understand biology. The first speaker is Bonnie Bassler, a professor and HHMI investigator at Princeton University. And she's going to give a talk which uh, is in the theme of biology inspired by chemistry. She's going to tell us about the language of cellular communication. Bonnie. Uh, thanks. I'm absolutely delighted to be here and to kick this off. And so let me share my screen with you to get going. So you already got a good introduction um, of what I'm going to tell you about it. But in my words, what I want to try to ask or what my gang is always trying to ask is how bacteria get any bang for their buck. You know, bacteria are really tiny and yet they do all these terrible and all these miraculous things. And my group always tries to understand how they can manage to be so powerful. So, th so we're, I'm gonna try to tell you that it's about chemical communication and that it spans domains. Okay, so what we think is that for bacteria to do the beneficial and the harmful tasks that they do, they have to understand times when they're alone and times when they're in groups. So they can behave differently under those two scenarios. And so the way that they monitor whether they're alone or in groups is through a chemical communication process that we call quorum sensing. And that's shown on my first slide in a cartoon. So when bacteria are alone, they wanna have the program of gene expression going that's good for acting as an individual. So they're carrying out some subset of the tasks that they're capable of doing, but among the things they do is that they make and release small molecules that I have drawn as these red triangles that we call autoinducers. So the world is big, bacteria are small, these autoinducers diffuse away, the bacteria can't detect them, and that says act like an individual. But as bacteria grow and divide, since all of the cells are making a share of this autoinducer molecule, the extracellular concentration of the molecule increases in proportion to cell number. And so when the molecule hits a particular threshold amount, the bacteria detect it and they infer from that detection event that they must have neighbors around. So in unison, all of the bacteria change their gene expression, they change their behaviors together, and they begin to carry out tasks that are only successful when all the cells act together. So group or collective behaviors. So in fact, the bacteria don't have a clue whether they're alone or together or how many cells they're around. They're using the chemical as a proxy for cell number. And they believe, if you will, that the chemical tells them something about how many neighbors are around. So that's quorum sensing. And so we've discovered a number of the molecules that the bacteria use to talk to each other. And we think that it takes at least three molecules to have a proper quorum sensing conversation. So I'm going to show you three. These come from Vibrios, which is where quorum sensing was initially discovered. So I'm showing you particular molecules, but um, the principles, so bacteria tinker with the molecules, they change the molecules, but the principles I'm telling you transcend all quorum sensing systems that we know of. So there's always a molecule that one and only one species makes. So in this case, this homoserine lactone, and that molecule is for intra-species communication. This is how I count my siblings. Then there's a molecule we discovered, this fatty acid, that all vibrios make, but nobody but vibrios make, as far as we can tell. So this molecule is for the genus. So this molecule says you're my cousin, this molecule says you're my twin. Then the third molecule we discovered is broadly made in the bacterial world, gram negatives, gram positives, and they all make the identical molecule. So we think this third molecule on the bottom has no species information in it. It simply says other. So now what we're starting to think about quorum sensing is quorum sensing is about counting your neighbors, but it's also about telling how closely or how distantly related my neighbors are to me. So the molecules encode something about number and something about species relatedness, right? So that bacteria then can tell self from other with these molecules and they be behave appropriately based on the blend. So in back, going back to my original cartoon, we think the computation the bacteria do is as follows. The first thing they do is they're asking, 
am I alone or am I in a group? And so they start to, to detect quorum sensing molecules and that sets the program of genes that they turn on and off based on being alone or in a group. But then the more sophisticated computation they do is they measure the ratios of those molecules that I just showed you. And that says, is it me and my kin in the majority or is the enemy in the majority? And then they change their behavior based on whether they're winning or losing and who is in the consortium. Okay, so they can sell self, self from other and they use that information to behave appropriately under the different scenarios that they find themselves in. All right, so that's my background on quorum sensing. And now I want to tell you, of course, about some new science. So I'm going to stick with Vibrios and I'm going to tell you about new findings that we have in the global pathogen Vibrio cholera. So perhaps you know that Vibrio cholera is an endemic bacterium that causes a um, diarrheal disease. People get cholera from drinking contaminated water, eating contaminated food. And so cholera must have quorum sensing to be a pathogen. We showed that. And the way that this insidious bacterium works is that when it gets into the host at low cell density, it kind of comes in guns loaded. It's highly infectious. It's making a biofilm. It's spewing out its toxins. And then in the intestine, as it grows and multiplies, quorum sensing autoinducers kick in and that tells cholera to shut down its virulence and biofilm genes, turn on its escape genes, and it escapes in high numbers out to infect the next victim. So it has to have quorum sensing, but it's all about dissemination. And so we showed that quorum sensing systems using the molecules that I just told you about control that switch. But then about a year ago, we discovered a new quorum sensing system in cholera. So what uh, uh, we discovered was there was a receptor uh, which is in the cytoplasm that we named VQMA for Vibrio quorum A. There was a cytoplasmic receptor. This is a transcription factor that at low cell density, when the autoinducers aren't there, turns on virulence, turns on biofilm. So just like I told you, cholera is infecting and it's really um, pathogenic. Then at high cell density, a new autoinducer accumulates that we named DPO. This molecule binds to the VQMA receptor. It turns on a small RNA. So these are like micro RNAs in eukaryotes that shuts off all the virulence genes and turns on the escape genes. We discovered what that molecule is. This was a graduate student, a first year graduate student named Justin Silpy for his rotation project. He discovered this molecule that we call DPO. And this is a picture of it. It's made from threonine and alanine. So a very simple molecule. And what I should tell you is that this molecule and the three that I showed you on the last slide, every one of these is a brand new molecule to mankind. So these bacteria are ingenious about making molecules that await discovery and have all these functions. In this case, controlling quorum sensing. Okay, so this switch controls virulence in cholera and it tells cholera to leave the host at high cell density. So when Justin had made those findings, he was trying to understand more about this new system. And he found this interesting asymmetry. He found that the VQMA receptor, this transcription factor, is present in every Vibrio, but no bacterium except Vibrios have that receptor. This molecule, DPO, by contrast, was broadly made in the bacterial world. So all kinds of bacteria make DPO. So he was trying to understand the difference between production of the signal molecule and reception of the signal molecule. And that is still a mystery in our lab, but because, and we haven't solved that. But what was interesting is that what Justin found was that he did find another VQMA, but it wasn't in a bacterium. He found a gene for VQMA, for a quorum sensing receptor on a phage. And so phages are viruses that infect bacteria. And so this phage called VP882 infects Vibrios. So it's a little plasmid, it's a phage, it gets into Vibrios. And then what happens is that this phage has to decide, stay or go, stay or go. And so that's called lysogeny, when it stays, lysis, when it goes you know, when it replicates and kills the host and goes to a new um, host bacterium. And so the lysis decision was, we could see genes on this uncharacterized phage that control the lysis decision, like in classic phage biology. There's a repressor called C1 that represses an anti-repressor called Q that turns on the lysis genes. So when the host gets in trouble, when there's stress, when there's DNA damage, C1 gets cleaved, 
Q gets made and the cells lice. And that has been discovered in many, many phages for over a hundred years. So we could understand that part of the phage. Our question was over here. Why is there a bacteria? presumably a bacterial quorum sensing receptor on a phage. There had never been a connection between phages and bacterial quorum sensing before this. So we wondered why is this quorum sensing receptor there, the gene for it, why is our quorum sensing receptor there? And so we wanted to study that. And of course, I've just told you that we had just discovered DPO and this transcription factor VQMA. So we knew an experiment to do. We could add this autoinducer and see what happens. So what we did was we put the phage, we infected Vibrio cholera with that phage. And now you're just looking at a growth curve. And what you can see is that cholera grows just fine. It grows fine. But then if Justin adds DPO, he adds the autoinducer molecule, what happens is that the phage receptor detects it and then it turns on lysis and kills all of the cholera at high cell density. So that shows you that this phage is eavesdropping on bacterial quorum sensing. It's monitoring the bacteria growing and at high cell density, which, the, which occurs when these autoinducers accumulate, the phage kills the bacteria, the present host, and spreads to another. And so if you think about it, right, it's a really great strategy for this phage. Like phages, right, if they don't, if they decide to kill their present host, but they don't get to another victim, they're goners. So when's a good time to kill your host? Well, at high cell density, because there's lots of other cells around to be infected. So this phage is surveilling or eavesdropping on quorum sensing in the host. So then Justin wanted to understand how does that work? How is this phage, this new quorum sensing system connected to this lysis program that's classic that I told you about? So he did a genetic screen to find what component connects phage quorum sensing and the lysis machinery. And what he found was that the gene or the component that connects it was sitting right next to the VQMA gene in the phage. There was a tiny little gene, this red one, running in the opposite direction that encodes a 78 amino acid protein that has no homology to anything in the database, nothing. So Justin got to name this protein. And so he calls it Q-tip for quorum triggered inactivator of C1 protein. So Q-tip connects phage quorum sensing to lysis. And so what Justin next wanted to know is how does Q-tip do its job? And I'm just going to show you the answer. What Q-tip does is it sequesters this repressor and inactivates it. So what you're looking at, this is just a picture of E. coli under a microscope, and it has the C1 protein cloned into it. And that has a halo tag, so the E. coli turned green. And so what you can see is that the C1 is diffuse in the cytoplasm. If Justin co-expresses his new protein Q-tip with C1, what you can see is that Q-tip drags all of the C1 out of the cytoplasm to the poles in these inclusion bodies and it inactivates it. And now I hope you can see why we call this protein Q-tip. These E. coli look like real Q-tips to us. And so all of the C1 goes to the poles and it's inactive. So this C1 is active the C1 is inactive. So that explains the mechanism. When the phage launches quorum sensing, Q-tip gets made, Q-tip drags C1 out and the cells die because the phage lyses them. Okay, so now what I should tell you is that that is the first time that there has been evidence that phages um, interpret signals other than cell stress or DNA damage. And so this idea that they're monitoring host biology was new. And so we worried at that point that this was just some one-off. There was this weird phage, you know, out there, it had these genes, you know, maybe it was just an, an anomaly. So once Justin had this little module of these two genes, then he could do a better database analysis. And sure enough, what he found is that this is not a one-off. He could find all kinds of plasmid-like phages. So these are phages that live as plasmid in their cells, all of which have this classic lysis machinery, and every one of which has a transcription factor, and right next to it, in the opposite direction, a tiny little protein. So these transcription factors and these little red proteins are not like one another. They don't share homology, but they all function the same. So what I mean by that is we can clone any one of these out and they will sequester any one of these C1 repressors. So they work by the same mechanism. So we think this might be common that phages are eavesdropping on bacterial host biology.
And so to put it together, what I'm telling you is that in our case, this phage is monitoring this quorum sensing autoinducer DPO, that molecule at high cell density, this these bind, the transcription factors turns on Q-tip, Q-tip um, drags C1 out of solution, Q is unleashed and lysis happens. In these other cases, we don't know, you know, these are just database analysis. We don't know what these phages are monitoring. We don't know what host biology is involved. But what we're guessing then is that it's going to be common that phages eavesdrop or surveil appropriate host biology. And then using this new mechanism that Justin discovered, they lyse their host and go off to infect another victim when the time is ripe. And so we're really curious to try to solve what this biology is, but we don't know it. Okay, so now I've shown you that there's this new mechanism connecting quorum sensing to um, phage lysis. And so Justin thought, you know, what these phages are doing then is they appear to be re-engineering their lysis cascades to be tuned to some host information. So we thought, well, heck, if the phages can do that, I can do that. And so we thought what we could do is take our basic understanding that we had gotten from Justin's study, and then he could make a phage therapy by using what he had learned. So I'm going to show you one example. He made like a dozen of these, and I'll just show you one, and you can use your imagination to understand um, the rest of this. All right, so we have this phage, right? And I've told you the phage is a plasmid. So we can transform this phage into any bacterium that we care to, not just vibrios. We can just pop it into anybody. And what you understand is that it's all about this Q. If Q gets made, the cell is going to lice. So what and Justin did was he cloned different promoters in front of this Q gene, and these are promoters that he could control. So I'm going to show you this one example. He put a promoter, just 100 bases of DNA, for a promoter called IMVF. This is a salmonella promoter. So in salmonella, which is a, a pathogen. When salmonella is under virulence conditions, this transcription factor called Hill A detects virulence conditions and it binds the INVF promoter and turns on invasion genes and salmonella invades the host. Okay, but now what Justin's done is he's put the INVF promoter in front of Q. Then he put this recombinant phage into salmonella. We put salmonella under virulence conditions and Hill A did its job. It went and turned on this INVEP promoter. The problem was it's on front of Q. And so all of the salmonella committed suicide, right? So you get it. He can control that Q gene and then the, the phage will do its job and kill the host, right? So now you get it. It's not about vibrios. You can put this in any bacterium. And I told you that Justin made 10 or a dozen of these, you know, and so you can, you can take, if you know the, a promoter and can control it, like with the rabidos, tetracycline, IPDG, or anything you want, if you can control the promoter, you can get the phage to kill on demand. And so we hope then that this little, it's a toy application could help our colleagues who make applications and perhaps they could, people who are better at it than us could maybe make this into some kind of phage therapy that is controllable. All right, so that's the applied part of the work. And let me finish by just going back to the basic part of the work. And I'm gonna to put together what I've told you in the context of you know, other of our findings. So cholera has to get into the host. When it gets into the human host intestine, it decides stay or go, stay or go. That decision is mediated by quorum sensing, by a number of quorum sensing systems, including this new one that I told you about that involves this DPO molecule. So it makes and and DPO, DPO accumulates when, when VQMA bind, the cholera VQMA binds DPO, cholera disperses from the host and goes to infect the next patient. You remember that I told you that lots of bacteria make DPO. What Justin showed is that microbiome bacteria make DPO. You might even remember I told you that DPO was made from threonine and alanine. So it turns out that your microbiome, which is there keeping you healthy, it lives, part of what it lives on is a protein called mucin. So mucin is a protein that covers our intestinal cells. It keeps them hydrated. It keeps the microbiome bacterium a little bit far away. And microbiome bacteria use mucin as an energy source. They have mucinases. They're supposed to. 
right? You, the host, supply them with this mucin. So it turns out that every third amino acid in mucin is threonine. And so it turns out that you feed your bacteria mucin, they take the threonine, and what they do is that they make DPO. So now DPO accumulates even more than what cholera makes. And it turns out that if a mouse, not a human yet, but a mouse has particular DPO making microbiome bacteria, DPO accumulates too fast and cholera disperses prematurely. So what we think then is that you, the human, and your microbiome are teamed up to use DPO to trick cholera into miscounting and dispersing early. And so for sure, these mice, mice, not humans yet, get less severe cholera disease. It's known that some people get bad cholera disease and some people get mild cholera disease. And we wonder if this DPO and the microbiome might be a part of it, but that's not been shown. And then last now for today, we have to add another player here, which is the virus, right? So the parasite of the parasite is also monitoring this DPO and it's deciding stay or go, stay or go, stay in my present cholera or, or kill my current hosts and escape to the next. And so what's so interesting to us is we no longer know how anybody counts appropriately. All these organisms are using this molecule and making it and consuming it, right? And so we're trying to understand how bacteria and viruses count robustly in these complicated scenarios, that's our next task, right, is to try to do experiments now that are much more complex, where we have lots of players involved, and we're not just shaking them around in a flask, and we try to set up these authentic conditions to understand how this works in real life. But at least what we know is that all of these organisms seem to optimize off this DPO molecule that's just made from threonine and alanine, right, these two little amino acids, right, but a brand new molecule, a brand new um, quorum sensing circuit, and we think then and that this is at least a three-way conversation that has eukaryotic cells, beneficial bacteria, harmful bacteria, and viruses all working somehow to use this molecule to count. Anyway, so obviously there's lots of mysteries for us to solve, and these are the kinds of questions that we're working on on this project. And I will finish by telling you, showing you Justin Silpe. So Justin Silpe was a rotation student. He solved the structure of the molecule when he was a rotation student, decided to join the lab, and he did all of the work on the phage that I told you about. And uh, that's my talk, and I really look forward to the rest of the symposium one more time. I'm delighted to be here and to answer your questions after we hear a few more talks. So thanks.